And then finally, teachers and students. Do the students like it? Are we training the teachers? You know, and the feedback loop, which is kind of what we have today. Did I miss any pieces of what you see as the, the important part of the program here? Anybody? Support, perhaps? Okay. So the actual robot. Here's a beautiful pile at Parallax, um, getting ready to ship somewhere. They come in a little box like this, and this box is handy for um, holding your built-up robot. So it arrives in a, with a bunch of bags, <laughs> components, hardware, a little wrench, screwdriver. And I wanna say, putting it together is an important part of the experience. Um, Wayne, John, students you work with, they probably like this step, right? They love it, yeah. Yeah, it's great. I mean, when I was a kid, we'd have wood shop and metal shop and things like that. And I'm surprised how many kids come along. They really don't know what a lock washer is and things like that. So it's a great opportunity for us older guys to, to talk a little bit with the, with the younger students about simple tools. So, John, you value the whole mechanical building part, right? Yep. yep That's what you're great. saying. Yeah, I love it. Okay, yeah, it's interesting, and I sometimes just breeze through this, but even my own kids who grew up around everything possible mechanical haven't really used like a lot of, lot of tools. So I guess you gotta be like in a construction family, <laughs> but um, it's true. We hear over and over putting it together so much fun. So it's a two to four hour process. And um, I wanna say if you're a teacher auditing this work, you really wanna take your time to make sure they get every little detail right. All right, I'm talking about the, the lock nuts being on right, um, things being square and tidy, you know, the wires being tucked away. You can press them for workmanship. You can do a poor job assembling the robot. So it's a good, in good introduction to basic electronics also. Great. And we do have a question in the Q&A pane. Um, Let's take it for the right time. It's from Aliza and she says, do you suggest teaching high schoolers in Blockly Prop or C? Maybe a big topic. <laughs> wow, I think I might even go to John on that, but <clears throat> briefly, my experience is that with Blockly Prop, everybody's included and everybody can do it. And I would s suspect that C is a good scaffolding tool. John, what's your thought there? <clears throat> What we do is we think the middle school is a transition from block languages to text languages. On the software side and on the hard side, we view it as a time to go from sealed up uh, robots into component level robots. And we do that all around sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Uh, so I would suggest that once they get into eighth grade and above, that they go with the C, um, perhaps some blockly prop to, to ease them into that if they haven't done any other programming. Uh, and below this sort of seventh grade or so, uh, we work with them in block languages. Yeah, good. Okay. I mean, the reason I like Blockly Prop is I can get a lot done fast. And um, we can outcode, you know, a project really quickly with block language compared to writing C. So it's just faster. But um, yeah, these are all things to think about. The hardware you're using, uh, here's a quick look at the propeller activity board. This is the board that's on the robot. And I'm not gonna get into um, all the details of this. This is one of those things you appreciate after you start using it, then you discover really what it's made of. But some of the really fun stuff on here, there's an audio amplifier. Um, so for example, you can connect a speaker, like here's one of my projects. <laughs> And so that's actually a servo, that's a glue stick. And I'm using the audio amplifier, which you see on the board. And then there's a, a sound file in a WAV format stored on that SD card. It's tucked in there. So stuff like this, you, you learn about and discover as you go. And My then laughing you, skull has that. <laughs> oh, hey, feel free to show that. <laughs> I don't know how to do that here. <laughs> Another topic has come up in the chat pane. Um, Teresa's asking, does this mean that you unbuild the bots for each semester? And Wayne has answered that they do, but I know that not every school does. And You know, I'm that? surprised by this, this question. So I talked to a lot of teachers that have them tear it down. And I'm an advocate of that. And I, I think it's great to go super slow, deliberately every step, and give them that whole experience. I mean, it, it adds like two to three hours at the end of the, the year to tear them apart, but every student wants to build them 
And then that's a chance to get your parts replenished. Have you heard, Stephanie, most people are keeping them together? No, not actually. Okay. But I just wondered, uh, since we have teachers here with us, what their preferences all are. Yeah, Wayne, John, what are you doing? Because you have a lot of these. We, um, I, I take ours apart at the end of each semester so we can go back through with the, with the, with the new class on rebuilding it. I, I think there is something there. Um, there's a lot for them to learn, putting it together. They get to see how, um, uh, how the bots go together. And when we start talking about how one wheel, you know, travels clockwise, the other counterclockwise, they kind of get a better understanding of why that is since they're the ones who put the servos in. Um, and uh, the attention to detail, that's, that's pretty important too. So yeah, we, um, I take them apart and have the, have the new kids put them back together. Thank you. A few tips on that from our experience. Number one, I keep a couple of them assembled and that way if a kid's uh, sick for a week or something like that, you can just hand it to them. They're not in a situation where they feel they're way behind. The second thing is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, get yourself a big handful of all those, I forget what it is, 824, uh, screws and standoffs and, and uh, the uh, lock washers and so on and so forth because that's the stuff that always goes missing and you, exactly Ken's holding it up that's what you want to do. That's all 440 hardware there and we do sell the baggies that come with the robot as a replenishment item. I've put a link in the chat pane that goes to our page that has all of the activity bot related products if you scroll down including the small robot hardware refresher pack. There's also Perfect. a pressure pack for the electronics. <laughs> and so one more thing on that topic, I have teachers that um, will sort out every single component and keep them in Plano boxes at the front of the class, which uh, kind of look like this. Uh, these are the boxes from Walmart. And this is a great way to store parts. And even though the resistors are very low value, it helps to have them all handy so you don't have to waste time. So the size of the robot, um, here it is compared to the common house cat. That's fluffy, by the way, but this picture will confuse you. <laughs> did the cat get small or did the robot get big? Anyway, that's a, a giant 5X size robot we're building right now. Depends on which pill you took. <laughs> exactly. That robot's almost three feet long. Um, just here's one of the pictures this is of the assembly instructions. So before we move on, one of the really neat parts that makes this robot very capable is this motor and then um, the, the software library that runs it. And I'll, I'll show you an example in just a minute, but this is a, a servo that has feedback. You see it has a yellow IO line on it and that outputs a pulse back to the um, controller and it's able to then position the servo and see where it is to give you precise movement and precise distance. So you can have speed, distance, ramping with the feedback motor. So of all the robots we have, this servo plus the, um, the powerful multi-core microcontroller and the library that controls it let you do a lot of things that are not easily done on um, bow bots or shield bots for Arduino or the Cyberbot. Teresa Hendrickson has raised her hand, so she is oh, um, ready to talk. I think I raised my hand to ask my other question, so oh. I am good and listening. Okay. Hi, Teresa. <laughs> Oh, you, and maybe you want to share your experience too now that I see you're here at some point. <laughs> you're working on the cyber, the cyber hacking stuff from Vanderbilt. Yeah, we so. have uh, activity bots. Uh, we've been connecting to over the internet to Vanderbilt's uh, API environment. And we've managed to connect our bots together. And Using a version of Block, Blockly Prop, I'm not familiar with all the different variations yet. I'm still a beginner in this area, but I've got a student who has been able to control two bots, and he's been encoding his uh, communications. And you know, he's hacking one. I was hacking him at first. Now he's hacking <laughs> mine. But he'll be demonstrating that tomorrow as a part of my cybersecurity end of the semester exam. Awesome. Hey, well, welcome to the uh, community. We're glad to have you and uh, actually glad to have your experience working with the Vanderbilt material too. Yeah, thank you. You can go ahead and mute me again. All right. Just raise your hand again if you yeah, want. Teresa came into uh, teaching after industry too, so quite the background. All right, so let's just go look at Blockly Prop really quick. Um, we'll pop over here. Uh, this is it for those who've not seen it. Um, it's a drag and drop program environment and um, 
you have with the activity bot different kinds of blocks. You have speed and you have distance. So we could just uh, program right now the robot just to move. And we will go uh, centimeters, 20 centimeters or so. And then we'll get a look at the robot. So um, in this interface, a few things I want to show you briefly. Um, if you right click on anything here and you click on help, you'll go straight to the help file for that block. And this is where Stephanie spent the majority of her career at Parallax. This material is tremendously helpful. Okay, so you want to know about it. And you can browse here and get ideas of possibilities too. So that's one thing. The other thing is two different kinds of download. One is RAM, which um, only downloads and runs once when power cycled, it turns off. Then the other one is EEPROM. So we'll put that into EEPROM and we will just watch the robot go. I'll switch my camera over. So I'll hit reset on that and it's going to travel 20 centimeters. So that's difficult to do in other robots because distance is a function of time and speed that you kind of have to figure out. But uh, this robot has a lot of flexibility in that way with the encoders. So if you want to bring in the speed blocks, you can do that. Um, and the distance blocks, by the way, are blocking so that once you're running one, <clears throat> Stephanie, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you can um, interrupt it with a sensor, for example, right? That's correct, distance blocks are blocking. Okay, so for example, We'll go forward, then we'll go backward at this speed. And then we will, um, so for how long, and you have to have these blocks, and then you have to stop it too. You have to issue a stop block. So we'll download that. There might be errors in my program. I'm not paying much attention to it, but. Can I ask a question, Ken? Yeah. When you said you couldn't interrupt it with a sensor, the following robots I made using the laser pings, I have the laser pings in a different cog. Oh, uh-huh. And it seems to me what I'm looking at is it does interrupt it because you saw how well they followed. Yeah, them. okay, so. <laughs> Topic for another webinar, but um, excellent. So what Carol's doing, she's taking advantage of what the propeller can do. And there are eight cores here. Now some of these blocks actually do use other cores and that's in our documentation. But she did something like this. Um, she had some lasers that she was checking and she made a function for them and she put it into a new processor. And so let's see here functions, where are those functions at? Yeah, she did something like this. So you have eight, eight processors in the propeller and you can do parallel things. So were you able to interrupt a, a distance block then? You're using distance with um, real time navigation? I gotta think now. Come back and let's open that up yeah, at a, another distance. webinar. It was distance, okay. Mm -hmm. So here's a little uh, more of a program. Because they were maintaining distance from each other and right side and left side. Okay. So if, the, if the forward robot turned to the left, my two laser pings would see that movement and one would see that it's going away to the left at a certain distance and the other would see it's a lot further distance and then it would pull the right side back of the, the speed up the wheels so that it would follow it exactly trying to maintain distance. Well, let's get a look it, at so that. So the left and the right wheels were separate from each other and each yeah. one tried to keep a left or right side of the robot. Yeah, you understand um, the architecture a little bit more than most using this robot, but that'd be a good project for us to look at and kind of explain how it works. Now, there's some so. videos of it on my YouTube channel Cool. So here's another example. This one is just using uh, the ping sensor on the front right here and then on a stand it happens to have the Pixie 2 camera on it too. And as you can see from the main loop, um, I'm graphing the value. So that looks like this. There was a graph there for a moment. And here's your graph. And it's 100 every 100 milliseconds or more. 
So I'm just staring at the wall there, but now I'm looking in the sky. So if we let this robot run, you can imagine what it's going to do. So once the distance is less than 10, and that is um, centimeters, I believe, the robot's just going to turn. Okay, so if you're a C programmer, you can click on code and see your C code. And you can also download all of the files right here, download simple IDE files, and then open them up in our simple IDE program and then edit them in C. Everybody got that okay? <laughs> Lots of stuff there. Um, just about Blockly Prop in general. Um, it's a high level language. And what I said about it earlier, I, I very much believe to be the case. You can get a lot done very fast. You have an hour if you wire things properly, um, you can meet most goals. They can be dished out by a teacher in that period. So it guarantees a syntax for you. Um, you can write code that will not work, but the syntax will be correct. So it compiles everything. And John, question for you. You mentioned earlier that you divide your, your teaching into two different thought concepts, like sensing and branching and then moving and looping. Right, so. What do you mean by that? And now speak up just a little bit. You're kind of hard to hear. Sorry, how's that? Better. Uh, so when we think of projects, we think of the action of moving linked together with the, the um, control by looping. And then we think of sensing as associated with branching. And over the years, we've found that moving and looping is a little easier. So I always start with that. It's not the first tutorial in the list. It's the third last or something like that. But we find that is almost always foolproof. If you do the, the sensing and the branching, sometimes they have to get some adjustment in the sensor, some calibration. Uh, they can get confused on what the expressions are. So I just advise doing it in that order. When we pop over to tutorials, I might ask you again to uh, show that again. Sure. Okay, so the tutorials are the other important piece of this. Um, there are many aspects to our tutorials, but just super briefly, let's get a look at one of them. All right, so this is the whiskers. I'll zoom in a little bit. So usually we start the tutorials with a video that shows what it is. A real short video. This one's seven seconds, kind of what to expect. And you can see here, um, the circuit is just a, what we call whiskers. Little uh, sensors built onto the front that ground either to the IO pin, that is the microcontroller, or they go to the chassis. So we show students how to build these things what parts they need and very careful about all this. And then we provide, this is big, so we give them pictorial, a picture of the circuit. And when they start building with these, they're, they're using exactly the same breadboard holes as we are and everything, um, not knowing there's real freedom there. But pretty soon they pick up on the idea that, hey, you, you really can move stuff wherever you want it. This is really open and they add more parts on their own. So they get the pictorial and then they get the schematic and we are always trying to move them towards um, building by schematic. After you build these circuits, we treat them in subsystems. So as an example, um, this is testing the whiskers. What you should see, so no roaming yet, just a robot connected to a USB cable and a terminal and what you get when you press each whisker. And then we move it into actually a code that roams or uses it with the motors, which is what this would be. And then at the end, there are um, try this, and these are paired with our, your turn is paired with our tutorials. Try this is step, kind of step-by-step -step modifications of the program we just wrote. And then your turn is accompanied with our assessment material and answers for the teachers. So, these tutorials are available in, the way you get them is you go to learn.parallax.com and then you can click on activity bot with C tutorials and you'll see prerequisites in the main lessons. So here's the C version and then going back, I'm just gonna go to home because it's a little bit faster for me, clicking on activity bot, 
you'll see the Blackley prop equivalent. So they're, they're side by side. Anything to add there, Stephanie? You have a lifetime career in here. <laughs> Just as we're always um, updating and adding to the material, you can see in the pre prerequisites that the original getting started with Blockly Prop is still there. We could go back again. Hmm. And this one. we've. Yep, go back to the home. Oh, got it. Some of the things that would help the teachers too to get the kids stimulated is uh, went to a seminar that Matt was doing. And at the end, when we put our sensors on, these were for light seeking, instead of just doing the exercises in the book, he told us to put our robots on the floor, which we did. And the door was open to the classroom and that was the brightest light. All of a sudden, all of the robots started gathering around and heading out the door. <laughs> yeah, that's that was a great illustration. It was uh, funny to watch. It looked like they were all thinking the same thing and let's get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of fun and, and that's important too because all the other artificial light sources we use or the LED ones, um, the wavelengths are not natural and they're not our circuits are not really adapted for them. So the natural light is super powerful. If you just open a door or window, it'll be more powerful even overcast day than your flashlight, unless your flashlight's right on it. The reference guide, okay. Um, taking a look at this, I believe I have that open here. Okay, here's a Blackley prop reference. And um, this is not a tutorial, but it is a guide to using every single command. This is something you have to know about. And you can start in here anywhere you want. We'll just jump into sensor and look at one. And usually we'll show you the, um, the block, say what it does. And then sometimes you'll find a wiring example for that. So these are the two, two ultrasonic, one ultrasonic, one laser that we make, and then a code example. So the reference guide, and you can get here by right clicking on a block. And this is important for um, some teachers, others it doesn't matter as much, but every state has their own standards, it seems. Um, the, for example, the activity bot is aligned in California to several, but most importantly, it's an A through G course. So um, it qualifies as a UC approved elective or recognized. The material on the right, this is a typical assessment and uh, you can pass these out if you want. They're directly tied to our tutorials and I'll tell you how to get them. I'm curious, um, John, have you used these in your class? No, we don't. Um, I have such a stack of assessment materials going back a decade or so <laughs> that I, I've just used those, but I would like to take a look at these over, yeah. Cool, okay. So to get them, um, send an email to learnaparallax.com and we will reply with a login, which gives you access to the teacher side of our Learn website. And that's where you can get all the, the material that's available for whatever robot you're using. Now, finally, um, the students and teachers, really this should be number one here, um, but it's about the kids and whether or not they're enjoying it. And there is strong competition for their attention these days in classrooms, um, totally different than 10 years ago. And robots, and coding video games are one way to get them over. And here's a short video of uh, a reporter talking to some students. I don't know if you guys can hear that audio, can you? Can you hear the audio, Carol? No. Oh, okay, so probably it's not gonna come through, but um, yeah, basically the student's just saying, this is Blockly, it's really easy, drag the blocks out, and then you have to know how it's wired, and it's been fun to work with. So it's great when students tell it. And here's a teacher learning. We train about 500 teachers a year. Um, I'll tell you how to get involved in that. And we give them all robots. There's zero barrier to getting into our class. You just gotta show up. And uh, it's really fun to see all the teachers get down on the ground, play around with these things, <laughs> you know, and this is when the class, the whole vibe changes from, um, you know, putting things together, writing some code, getting over a few of the hurdles to like, wow, this is fun. 
Well, how do you feel about some uh, robot demonstrations? Okay. <laughs> Let's do that. All right, so um, yeah, a couple things we've got here. I'll just kind of go through them in no um, particular order. Uh, first, the salesman me has to show you the upcoming gripper product. So this is a single servo actuated gripper design, servos on the back of the robot, which closes on the object as long as it fits within the, the paddles here. Once it's closed, all the remaining movement goes into lifting the object. So for example, if you give it a, a block that's one inch or something that's half of an inch, it doesn't care about the difference. So it'll just lift it higher if it's wider. And what's really wonderful is you don't have to um, be too concerned about when you've actually clamped down on the object. All you have to know is the fully open and the fully closed extent of the servo. And this makes programming a lot easier. Okay, usually this is a two servo operation. Um, this is a new product that's coming out in like a month or more. Just wanted you to see it. So circuits, we'll clear the uh, desk over here and I'm gonna enlarge this for you. I think now my, my video should be occupying your full screen, is it? You guys still there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, All right. Okay. So this is the whisker circuit and this is a basic um, input output system. So two, two whiskers and then um, either grounding through the chassis or the IO pin. And it's just one form, the first form of detecting something. And it's a great way to learn the basic movements of the robot to combine them. The other circuit that I like is light following. Carol was just mentioning this. So it's a couple of resistors, capacitor, and then some photo transistors. And this will follow light right out of my office. So I'll turn that on and I'll give it some extra light and try to try to keep it here. But as soon as that light goes away, it's, it's going right outside of the room. And like I said, the flashlight's just not enough to to bring it back to the dark side. Oh, there we go. What do you think of that one? We do have a quick question about the gripper. Okay. Are there any current model grippers I can buy for the activity bot? The ones that I prefer, and usually there's a little bit of adaptation, are those from Servo City. So they make um, some simple claws that are usually one degree of freedom and then some attachments for them that lift them for the second. And uh, so those are available, but I haven't actually mounted one up. There's some on Thingiverse. Oh, good. Okay, so if you got 3D printers and you have servos. So this yeah, one is... A, a real simple set of grippers. They don't move up or down. They just grip, close and unclose. And they're on Thingiverse. If you have that link, paste it in the chat or we'll distribute it too. Oh, okay. Here's a little more complex circuit. This is infrared emitters and detectors. And this would be on, I think this is on the circuit Teresa was using with the cybersecurity examples too. But um, the LEDs, which are in the little black housing, they send out IR light and then the receivers listen for it. So same thing that would be in your, um, you know, your DVR remote and receiver, for example. And this detects up to about two feet. So it's a form of wireless detection. And all of these have their, their benefits and drawbacks. Um, this one may not work well with black baseboard, for example, because it absorbs light. So the same circuit can also be used for robot following. All right, so instead of bouncing off of it, you can actually train it to follow behind another robot. So if you tape a business card or a three by five card behind the robot like this, then you can follow. And that's really cool for line following, oh, which I think I'm gonna have to show you in a minute. So here's an, let's get out this. Here's a line follower. And let me grab a line following course. Can I ask a question while you're setting that up? Yes. We have a question from Christina in chat. If we have done a training, can we do another one? Or <laughs> is there a more advanced in-person training available? You're showing a lot of um, 
accessories that are not part of the uh, original training. So I think it's a good question. Um, we could do, I, I don't know what district you're in or where you're located, but we do go out and do courses with whole districts. And we are getting to that point where we need to do more advanced trainings. Um, for example, some of the future webinars we will do will be on cameras and vision and advanced sensor use because people, the capability is going up, but we don't as a routine, routine do these, but I think you can learn them quite easily on your own through our project tutorials. And um, also by just jumping onto the forums or the Facebook Blockly group. So. And then where you where the hardware appears, and this is a future slide, so I'll hold it for a minute, but there are code examples with all the different hard, hardware that we offer. So this would be the line follower. And um, incidentally, I did, did discover something new, which is you can buy these really wide felt tip pens at art supply stores and use them for line following. So it's a lot of fun. Um, That fast, I mean, students want to draw these things, right? So here's here's something you can do. And then you can code in stops, gaps. Um, you can add another robot to this to do self-driving cars, um, put in crosswalks, you know, the open and close. It's just a, a whole, whole wide world with line following. It's probably one of my favorites. Okay, and then more advanced, and this would be a project that is published. So I'll show you how to find the projects briefly, and then we'll, we'll talk about this robot. Um, oh, here it is. So if you just go to the activity bot tutorial series, and then you scroll down, uh, the projects are on the bottom. So these are all extra hardware items, you know, the infrared remote controls, um, IR beacons, radar or pingdar we call it line following so open these up um, one just appeared today <laughs> it's the cmu cam 2 or the pixie 2 but like here's line following and usually we'll tell you uh, what hardware is required and then we'll take you through the same process as the tutorials and um, build it step by step so this robot um, has a speaker on it and an infrared receiver, a ping sensor, and the ping's mounted on a virus, so it's going to scan. And I will start it with a remote control and select the different, I don't know if you got that, my connection went a little bit unstable, but now I'm back. So I'll start it with remote control, and the numbers on it will choose a different song that is stored on the SD card as a WAV file. And this is also a project shown. So we'll just turn it on and let's see if it works. So I'll try number two. All right, and then I'll start the robot. And you may not be able to hear it, so I'm gonna have to, uh, maybe I'll pick something like maybe some Ozzy Osbourne if I've got that. And I'll put it closer here. All right, put that by the mic. So yeah, it's actually quite loud. So here you have music, roaming, scanning, and that sensor is scanning between zero and 180 degrees and looking for the closest object and then based on its location, turning away. So this could do well in like an auditorium or a big room. And because it's such a crowded environment on my desk, it's not gonna get very far. So what do you think of that one? Okay, you want more music and sound? <laughs> All right, so here is uh, May the 4th be with you. And this one consists, that's a, a hot glue gun stick with what's called a NeoPixel mounted to the side of it. What do you think? Can you, with it holding still, show us how you did the lightsaber again there? Yeah. Yeah, so I took a servo and I just, um, you know, made a little funny mount to plop it on the breadboard. And then I got really lazy 
and I took a hot glue stick and I just glued it to the servo horn. And then I used um, our WS2812s, which are available in a 10 pack, I think. You solder them together. Actually, I'm using a strip. I'm using something a little different. I'm using a strip of them and I just glued that behind the glue stick. And this has no sensors on it. This just kind of roams around sort of dumb, I guess you'd say. <laughs> And then a little more advanced, this is a favorite of many. This is the kitty cat bot, and we'll move on from demos. Stephanie, is this yours or is this Courtney's? I did the original application with spoken words and Courtney adapted it to meows and kisses. Okay, so let's get a look at it. Do you want to describe it? You mean it's functionality or it's decor? <laughs> Either. <laughs> Well, at one point we did have an internal contest for employees for dressing up a robot chassis and um, someone got out their uh, bedazzler it looks like for that one. Okay, um, so how it works. It drives until an object's detected and then when it gets there, if you don't move, it hisses. Okay, and if you do move, I believe it purrs, so we'll try it with a, uh, okay, this one will move. We have a question. Is the scanning on the remote control robot with the ultrasonic distance sensor? Yes, the scanning on the remote control robot yeah. is with the ultrasonic version of the ping. We do have a laser version of the ping. And they are pretty much code compatible. So I believe you could try that with either one. Okay. Um, aside from that, I just should point out there are a lot of things Blockly Prop can do that are well beyond robots for projects. Uh, for example, um, this little thing right here is a wireless GPS receiver. So outside of my office, I have a GPS module. <laughs> and it's transmitting its location back inside my office over these, these radios called XBs and um, displaying the lat long elevation, et cetera, on this little display. It's probably hard to see, but you could figure out where I am um, by looking at this. And this is more of a commercial product type thing. There are products made with Blockly Prop. So not all, not all Blockly Prop stuff has to roll. We have a lot of interesting demos at Parallax. Um, this is one of them. This is using the, the ColorPal color sensor and LEDs so that when I, it reflects the, the color or actually displays the color that I'm looking at. So if I choose red, looks like that. Put the sensor on it and you'll see red LEDs or orange or yellow, so on. So a lot of things you can do here that are, are non-robotic that I encourage everybody to look at. The robots are a great way to get started though. Okay. Questions about any of those things we've just shown? Or comments? I don't know if we get too far into this in, in education. Um, Wayne or John, if you get to get into this, like I think some students are into robots, some like circuits. We have a raised hand here. I'm unmuting. Is that Eliza? Hi, Eliza. I think you need to unmute yourself on your end. There you there go. Hi, you, you had answered my question. I had raised my hand before I typed in my question. So it's awesome. been already oh, answered. Okay. You, <laughs> you got to tell us where you're from. <laughs> um, I'm from New York. All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you can't get away without us asking you a question, huh? <laughs> So I showed you the gripper and let's talk briefly about, um, yeah, just how do you get into this? <clears throat> the robots are available individually like this or, um, oh, first though, you might want to get some of these goodies to go with them. And there is a ping sensor with a um, servo that sweeps back and forth, line follower, crawlers, remote controls, and this little pack of parts on the bottom, these are just very useful to have. And Teresa's asking if there are projects for each of the demonstrations on the website. Most. 
definitely yeah. post. And if there's one that you saw that we don't, we will be glad to at least share the code. Yeah, and for example, right now, you may have seen just a few minutes ago this, this camera sensor, and we're working to adapt this into a project too so that we could recognize colored blocks and then pick them up with the gripper. So that would be published pretty soon too. I just put a link on there, Steph, to um, uh, a walking robot since Ken was talking about they didn't need to be rolling. Okay, I think these were shared privately. I will copy and paste them and share them with the group. Ah, excellent. There's also a 12 pack. And as you look at this, you say, well, 12 robots, that's more than buying them individually. But there's a lot of stuff in here you could use to uh, scaffold your students. Um, there are ping sensors and servos. So you could have the, uh, the sweeping servo with the ultrasonic. And there are remote controls, infra remote controls, extra components, and rechargeable batteries. So this is one way a lot of people prefer just to get started, just get everything in a box and, and move on. But it doesn't matter, we'll, we'll help you any way you wanna go. And here's an interesting device. This was suggested by John Kaufman. John, where does this thing fit in? Uh, it first started when I realized sometimes students were absent. They came in, they didn't have a hardware build uh, and they were really behind or they were coming to me to troubleshoot and I had kids at different levels and I was trying to quick rebuild things. So what I designed was a way that you could take each of the projects you're doing, solder them up on this board, and then you could just hand that board to a kid and they're caught up. They don't have to do the building. Or if they're coming up, I'm just swapping them out myself. Or if they're having a problem troubleshooting, I can say, hey, here's a known good hardware. Now you figure it out if it's in the hardware or the software. It's also good for the kids who are a little more advanced, like high school students to come down and get some practice soldering. Yeah, so that's your invention and then we turn it into a product. It was something you needed. Here's a little video of it. I've so. actually used it for uh, circuits that I want to reuse over and over again on different Bobots so I don't have to remake it every time. Yeah, great. And there's a totally cheap too. I think they're, you know, several bucks. And yeah. I have a question for you all too. Any of you can answer this. Um, when I'm in a class, students will often bring, you know, a big pile of uh, circuitry like this and say, hey, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> 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 and then my first response is, I know. <laughs> I, I'm curious how you handle them as teachers. Do you have them go back and get the subsystems working again? Or do you try to solve it for them so they don't get discouraged or a combination of the above? What are, what are you doing there? Because you can stop a class in its tracks helping one student. John or, or Carol or anybody? I get that a lot with my SRS students because, you know, they're mostly adults and they've kind of gotten into robotics, but they want to have a more formal introduction. So they, they buy the Bobots and build them, but they're often bringing in what they were doing before they bought the Bobot. And I do, like you just said, I ask them first which parts of it works. So you know, and me, then we start breaking down what each thing is, and then they begin to realize that they need to make each part work separately before they put it together. Pre-test everything. One small tip on that is sometimes I have them build that little subsection on a whole different circuit board, a whole different breadboard. Get that working. You know it works. Now compare your wires over and be sure that works, rather than having things on top of each other in the big mess. Yeah, I pre test um, every system before I put add more stuff to the project. Christina is saying via chat that she has troubleshooting sessions that are separate from class. Yeah. I think for me it it it, it depends on the situation and the student. So I, I I'm like other law enforcement. It's always it depends. But um, I will have students who just want me to do everything and I just don't um, yeah. and other students where I can start asking questions what was working what happened um, what what were you doing whenever it stopped working and we'll work we'll work we'll um, work on it together but one thing I do try to avoid I'm not perfect at it sometimes it just happens 
but I try to not build the circuit for them. I, I do, um, actually this was, a, this was a phrase I heard Ken actually use at the USA um, Science and Engineering Festival. Uh, it's it's good to uh, it's it's good to let them struggle through it sometimes. Yeah, and one thing you can ask them to do too is if you look at this circuit, we have red for power, black for ground, and then one color for signal. That happens to be analog in this case, so it can be near impossible to help them if they don't follow a standard in the class. I have found I just my my brain doesn't work. <laughs> So come up with your standard, but generally it's red for power, black for ground, and then yellow or blue for signal. Would you agree on that, Carol? Yes, always. <laughs> you see gets, my robots, you know yeah, that. <laughs> yours are beautiful. Yeah, I mean, beautiful workmanship makes it easier to fix. And sometimes it's not easy. Like here's a case where, you know, red, red goes to white and <laughs> black goes to signal or whatever, but just depends on, you know, what you're doing. I have OCD about wire harnessing. Great. I have to have them all straight and as short and as possible. Oh, your workmanship. I mean, it shows it and things work. So when you stay up all night, uh, you have success when morning comes, right? <laughs> Usually, yeah. So a few real world projects here. Um, extending Blockly to things of, of interest outside of robotics. This is Wayne's project. Wayne, can you tell us in the, the two minute summary what this is? Yes, yeah, so this, uh, this goes back to the, uh, all, um, all robots don't have to roll, I guess, or whatever, but um, in our class, we like to tr take real world questions and, uh, and use Blockly and uh, in our case, radio to try to get some answers. So in this case here, in our class, we were talking about uh, weather, what makes weather. Uh, we live right here on the uh, Atlantic coast. So um, we have the opportunity to talk about how the oceans uh, impact weather. So um, you, you can talk about how air temperature is different from water temperature and air temperature might be different in lo different locations. But to be able to put a project together and actually see it, that, that does something for, for the kids. And to be honest with you, I have as much fun doing these things as they do, if not maybe a little bit more. So um, I stole this design from, um, from another class that I, that I took. I loved it. It's a uh, dry box. Inside the dry box is a, um, uh, a propeller, um, yeah, I'm, uh, the propeller flip. Uh, connected to the, you saw the BME 680 a while ago. We have that inside there. We have two thermistors. One is uh, measuring air temperature and one is measuring water temperature. The BME 680 is measuring barometric pressure as well as temperature inside the box. Um, and we have a GPS module and uh, one of the, um, the parallax GPS modules inside there as well. And it's the, uh, the propeller is collecting that data and sending that over to an amateur radio terminal node controller, basically a radio modem, and then transmitting that out over something called the automatic packet reporting system. It's uh, over the two meter amateur radio band. This allows us to take these, uh, you see they're not particularly seaworthy, right? So we put them in the coastal rivers um, and we can have them different locations. And now as we collect the data, we can collect, we can graph our data. Um, or one other thing we also can collect is the um, the bad, how much battery power we have left as well. Um, but now we get to see how, um, how, the, uh, how everything works and see what the differences are and talk about that. So that's, that's what's going on there with the, with the buoy. So it's a fun project. And what? you're, it's a ham radio thing, isn't it too? Two it is. Yeah. Said. Yep. Carol? What kind of transmitter are you using? Uh, there's a, it's an, um, it's a Yezu, um, FT270. It's a two-meter um, submersible radio, uh, and it's powered by two 2.4-amp uh, uh, gel cell batteries, or I'm sorry, uh, lead-acid lead acid batteries. So. How are you getting your signal or the frequency uh, you want from the propeller to the transmitter? Uh, the, um, the transmitter itself is what's set to the frequency, so the, the, all the data and it's being sent over to the, term, to the uh, TNC, which is the modem, once it collects there, there's a signal that says uh, to go ahead and transmit, and that sends the push to talk signal over to the radio and then transmits the data out via uh, packet. It's basically packet radio. So there is a uh, nationwide uh, APRS frequency, 144.39. Uh, here we have two digipeters as well. So no matter where these things end up sitting, that, that thing will transmit, it'll hit a digipeter. 
Once it's a digi feeder, we can pick it up live if we want to, but it also goes out over an internet eye gate, and, and we can pick it up over the internet on at uh, APRS.FI. So. so, yeah, the radio has on the bottom a um, 3.5 millimeter three ring jack, right? Correct, yeah. And that's how you get all the signals to it in there. Is yes. there a modem required between the? That's, that's the TNC, yeah. That's it, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very so cool. What kind of range do you get? Uh, the, um, we actually have some of these buoys. I understand we're, we're in the coast, so there's not a lot that's in between us and the digipeter, but with five watts, we're hitting, we're hitting digipeters as far as 16 miles away. Line of sight. And with repeater stations, you can go further, right? Correct, yeah. And then you can go to the really long wavelengths and, well, control something around the world, I suppose. Uh, you can. Um, I actually do get emails from people as far away as Florida and Alabama saying that they've, uh, they've seen our APRS. So, yeah. That's a great project. Yeah, I, I can't wait. And I have a whole load of videos and pictures you sent me and the email is so big, my computer kept getting stuffed up on it. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm, what I want to do though is get them and put them in the forums when you're ready so everybody can see them because it's a wonderful project. I think we'll and, be ready soon, yeah. And you're pushing Blockly Prop and several yeah. other projects have done that. This is one. Um, Chip wrote wrote the code for this um, drop copter aerial pollinator on the left side in Blockly Prop. If he enabled his mic, he can tell about it because I see he's hanging out here. So he got to write code for his own processor using Blockly Prop, <laughs> but it's a commercial product. And are you going to, um, I've unmuted you, Chip, if you want to say something about it. So unless he shows up, I'll tell you about it. So. Um, in almond orchards and peach orchards, the bees now need help. And so this quadcopter drone spreads this synthetic pollen over the um, orchards in a very defined pattern. And it, it carries like a kilogram of it. And this stuff is really expensive. Okay, so it has to be precisely distributed. So Chip wrote the code for this in Blackley Prop that um, manages this, you know, a couple motors and what we call a slinger that sprays it around and has a little user interface with some push buttons on it. Really cool. So commercial product, company's drop copter. Um, I'm working on and have been for several years, many projects that don't get done. This is one on the right side. <laughs> and this is an autonomous surface vehicle. It's about three feet long. And I built it to um, navigate around in Lake Tahoe and do things that people are doing with boats right now, which is primarily um, taking water temperature samples we have an issue in this lake where the temperature is warming and we're getting more carp, bass, and even some like catfish type fish that were in one little tributary where some homes were and now they've escaped into the bigger lake and they're finding them where the water's warmer. And so we study the water temperature quite a bit and they go out with a big boat. So I wrote some Blockly Prop code um, to allow this thing to navigate. And one piece of it was what I showed you a minute ago um, with the GPS. And the next step, so I have the GPS link working with long distance radios, but I have to now make the boat navigate by GPS. I'm so, not holding you up with the cellular phone project on that, am I? <laughs> no, the longer you take, the longer I take. It's all fine. <laughs> Some of the stuff takes a lifetime, apparently. <laughs> I guess I better get going on that one. <laughs> yeah, so that's fun. Um, moving on. Okay, if you're interested in workshops, you can have us come to your area and do a workshop. You have to um, send an email to us. We start planning. Usually we need like three to six months, and we want 20 to 25 teachers, and we will provide the robots for them. Um, typically these are run through a community college who just volunteers the space or through your district. Um, normally it's like a CTE or a tech education mm -hmm. department or um, whatever you have a programming, you know, department um, district level in high school and that's fine. And we'll come out for a day and do a class. We have several coming up soon. One of them is in Rockland in a few weeks. It's around the Cyberbot programmed in Python. And this particular robot kind of like you heard earlier in this webinar has it's a cybersecurity series coming up um, where you can basically hack, hack other people's robots and use encryption keys and encoding and decoding. Cool stuff. If you're interested in the activity bot, we have a workshop at Parallax for this too coming up on February 27. And uh, there is no cost for any of these. You get your own robot 
And um, yeah, it's that, that easy. And then we also have them at other places in the country. Um, so at the moment we have scheduled um, Chicago, two in Chicago, uh, Utah, Southern California. So if you wanna throw your region into the, the mix, contact us and you can see our classes on parallax.com slash events. So if you're looking for help um, with Blockly Prop, you got a couple choices. Um, John, you mentioned the forums earlier. That's a tip you'd give teachers, right? Right, one of the assignments I give my uh, students early on is twofold. Number one, <clears throat> they have to take something that they've had a problem in, with and go on the forum and find a solution. And then the second thing is they have to post something to the forum. Even if it's as simple as, yes, I tried this too and it worked for me. But what I wanted to get them is completely familiar with that possibility for troubleshooting. Yeah, so you're teaching them how to learn and really how to be engineers when you do that. You have to go discover everything on the web. Yeah, great. So our forums are forums.parallax.com. And I think it's cool you send them there. Sometimes you have to have some thicker skin to withstand these places, but there are so many experts on here giving so much free advice. I recommend it as well. There's also this group, if you're into social media, this is <clears throat> our group. It's called Blockly for Microcontrollers. And um, it gets a lot of traffic, so you can go there. And for support, I wanna tell you about the Educator Hotline. And um, this is a no-nonsense, direct to our team way to get support. And it runs about 12 hours a day. Oh, look, it's raining right now. Isn't that neat? So somebody at Parallax must need some help. <laughs> Gosh, you'd think it was almost planned, right? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> feel free to use the hotline. And I have to tell you, teachers are always surprised when they, they call us and they get one of us. They're like, well, there's no phone waiting system, no numbers to press. It's like, nope, what do you need? Let us help you. <laughs> so we, we learn about what we do wrong and right with this kind of tool. And I think any, any kind of hardware you would buy for education, you should expect this because um, there's nothing more deflating and then when you're standing in a class and nothing's working. I know from my experience, I have my preliminary CTE credential, I would just melt and like turn, turn sweaty, hoping things turn around, you know, when you lose the class. But if you have a problem in class, sometimes it's something we could just help you with and get you going. There's a lot here. You got coding, um, circuit building, power supplies, tutorials, you know, web-based software. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, before we conclude, I just want to see what other kinds of question discussion we may have overlooked for the last couple of minutes here. Um, from the audience participants, you want to type in any questions or ask them, please do. And while a few of them queue up, John, question for you. So what's, what's happening now with um, student capability in middle school? You and I have talked about this. Are you seeing a change from all the STEM efforts? Gosh, what I see is the same thing as, as we had talked about. Um, I find kids coming into seventh and, uh, grade uh, that have a lot of skill already in programming. They're very comfortable in Python. And I think this comes from, they go to coding camps for a month during the summer. I think it's so easy to learn this stuff now on YouTube. They talk about it with each other. They're so mo motivated by making Minecraft mods and so on. And so I think is when they come into us and they're starting this, um, it's, it's a little tricky for teachers, especially teachers who are just starting in STEM and can be somewhat intimidated. So I handle it a couple ways. One is I always have a couple of kids come in and say, I know all this stuff. I say, well, why don't you stick around for a week or two and, and let's see what you can learn. And it's rare they've done this sort of robotics things. And when they start to get their hands on, they become enamored. They might be halfway decent in Python, but they've never actually done something where there's, there's things moving around and sensing and are solving problems. The second thing is there's all kinds of extensions available. They can look at projects that are on the forum and uh, you, can, you can keep these kids very engaged. Here's my main caution. As you go through from unit to unit, have them go deeper and deeper within that unit. 
Don't let them run ahead to chapters two, three, four, five, but let them work and work with everybody else on chapter one, but, but just doing it so much deeper, so much better. Um, and I think you'll find that a lot better. Are you finding a greater diversity in your classes now? Diversity of boys and girls or diversity yeah. of skills? Boy, we work on that really hard. And I have a little PowerPoint presentation on um, gender equity and STEM I'll be glad to send to you. Uh, sometimes we do classes for just the young women, uh, but we're a small school. And so if we only have five or six enroll, uh, there's a limit to how long my principal can carry that kind of thing and, and still take care of the numbers. Fortunately, I'm in, in elective time, so you have huge kids in band and chorus, and we can still offer some smaller groups. Um, unfortunately, in, in terms of ethnicity, we are not a real diverse school. Um, and so I would say it's about equal to what the population is of the school. Uh, so we work at that. Um, the one thing I think has sort of worked is they can start with me in seventh grade. So I go down in sixth grade and talk to them and just do a little experiment, a little demo ahead of time and try and really show the young woman that women that I'm interested in them. I respect them. Their questions are important. Uh, and hopefully that that's getting more of them to sign up in seventh. Wow, that's a good summary. <laughs> Some um, questions that have come in through the Q&A pane. Okay. So let's see, briefly for Teresa's question about the XB capabilities, um, pretty wide, I would just say in summary. Uh, you know, you can go, you can hopscotch from one module to another. They can connect to the internet as you're seeing. Um, the ones I was just showing work up to 20 miles line of sight and you know, this high powered version um, in Blackley Prop you have XB blocks. And so you simply start a block and you can send data. Uh, I think we have some examples for them. Um, for troubleshooting, okay. I think we can all answer this. Troubleshooting, what do we suggest here? We talked a little bit about using color-coded wires about subsystem, subsystem testing, going back to things that did work. Go into the forum and- um, I send people to learn parallax a lot so they can actually look up the references. To so use Thank the you. reference guide? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Makes me happy when someone uses them. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's um, Stephanie has a career in the reference guide as well. So <laughs> I it's, use it it's all great, the time. though. Um, so what John said when students come in and, yeah, I've already done all this stuff, I, I already know it all. And what they're saying is they've seen this before. Okay, yeah, they have because we're using this in first grade, but they've not used this with circuits and with something as capable as a, an activity bot. So uh, yeah, um, we are seeing a lot of skills, a lot of programming skills now in middle school, which is great. Related to that, we have a question in the chat from Carrie asking about coding camps in Python in California. So you're thinking of a multi-day camp, or are you um, interested in uh, with the robots? Interested in with the robot, um, come to one of our workshops. You'll see we have several already scheduled, um, one in Rockland, and then one in Merino Valley, and then another one in Rockland. This is using the Cyberbot, and this uses the Microbit, kind of similar looking uh, robot chassis, but different programming environment. And we, we get into Python, I'd say quite super surface wise, um, not, not, not so deep because the, it's simple how we use it, but it's a great way to learn. I didn't know anything about it a year ago and I've, I'm thrilled with what I've learned using this $17 micro bit. Oh, camps for kids. Um, I don't know about kid camps. Um, a little research with on that, I think online, could probably tell you. Um, I don't know if anybody else knows, but I know that I've seen and published in some educational magazines um, listings of camps. In the Sacramento area, there was Code, code in the Hood uh, Hacker Lab events that we took robots to a couple of times. And I don't know what region you're in, but look for Hacker Labs or Maker Spaces in your community, and that's probably. If they don't have them there, they will probably know who will locally. 
And Teresa, yep, you answered that question. So C and Blackly are for the activity bot, and then Python is for the micro bit, which is on the cyber bot. You could probably get ask Wit about setting up camps to teach things because he does that a lot. Yeah. Different subject matter, but he's familiar with both subjects, so he'd be a good one to. There are some organizations that buy an awful lot of our robots in summer for um, coding camps. Some, um, one of them is, I think, a, a Girl Scout organization. But yeah, they're definitely out there. Yeah, the Girl Scouts are using um, Legos. Also, they're using Arduinos and Shield bots. But oh, they did? Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know what their official program is. Maybe it's Lego. Then can I add? Uh, yeah. I Okay, so earlier uh, a person was asking about troubleshooting sources. Here are two things that help me. One is we have a strong buddy system. So basically they have to talk with each other. And in fact, like when they're turning in Java code at the top in the flower box, they have to say, who was it that reviewed their code and the date? So this is almost the exact same as they, as they do at Microsoft. Um, and the second thing is for some exercises, I put on the board checkpoints. So after you get this done, I or one of the other kids has to sign off. So that's one subsystem. When you get done the next subsystem, we have to sign off. So it's really easy to do, but it enforces what Carol was saying about get the subsystems to work before you try to troubleshoot the whole thing. And will you often have one student building circuit and the other getting the code ready? Absolutely. <laughs> um, but what you have to do is be sure they switch off. That's the problem. You'll have one kid who loves coding. So literally they'll do part of the project. Then when I come by, I'll say, okay, flip. The one thing I like about that is it demonstrates the possibility of getting communication problems between hardware and software. Um, as we all know, NASA and ESA have had this problem, and it certainly filters down where I thought it was pin 16, I thought it was pin 17. So there's some disadvantages, but uh, as long as you keep switching them back and forth, it works well for me. Great. Re really good advice. Well, this subject is so exciting to me. Um, I'm looking forward to chatting with Stephanie about the next things we need to do for everybody. <laughs> and we've had our webinar for an hour 20, so we'll conclude. I wanna thank um, Carol for joining us. She's always here to support our webinars. Um, John Kaufman, who I mentioned many years has been using our products in a variety of situations. And um, Wayne Green, and especially Stephanie, who makes everything move in the background. So thank you to you all. And if you have topics for our next webinars, um, please let us know what you'd like. We're thinking more, more advanced topics would be appropriate because um, we're seeing that everybody is getting started pretty successfully. So thank you very much and um, see you on the next one. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Don't forget my mailing address. <laughs> <laughs>